Okay. I'm off duty, so. All right. You could if you wanted. Good morning. Welcome to Spencerville Church. We're glad that you are here today on this Sabbath day. I pray that you're already being blessed. I know people are still coming from their Sabbath schools and making their way in. Feel free to walk in and find a seat as I am speaking. Today's sermon is a standalone sermon, but next week I'm beginning a sermon series called Unique, and it's from the book of Revelation, Revelation 10, 12, and 14 we'll be looking at. So I want to invite you to that and encourage you to invite others to it. Uh, it is unique, 
and we were talking about unique roots, unique mission, unique message, and we'll be looking at Revelation chapter 10, chapter 12, and chapter 14. But we're glad to have all of you here with us, and I pray that you all are being blessed already. As you can see behind me, we have uh, WAU, Washington Avenue University's Pro Musica group with us, and we're so glad to have them and excited to have them under the direction of Anwar Otley, and we just appreciate them when they come and, and they bless us. I think most years you've been here, but obviously we had some gaps in there for COVID, but we're so glad to have you all here with us. We already had Enrique on piano in first service and Daniela, so some of you get to hear the sermon twice, so don't give it away, but we are glad to have them here with us, and, and uh, we're glad to have all of you. If you are a guest here today and you are looking for a church family, I want to let you know that uh, you can pull out your Connect card that's in your bulletin, and you can let us know, and we will follow up with you through that Connect card. If you uh, have a prayer request, you can let us know on that as well. If you're interested in baptism or, or um, learning more about the church, you can let us know on that. And at the end of the worship service, we have two offering and tithe boxes that are in the foyer. You can go ahead and put those Connect cards in there. That's also where you can put your tithes and offerings if you came prepared to give uh, today uh, at the tithe and offering boxes. We have uh, some membership transfers that we need to uh, acknowledge. First, I want to mention our outgoing Carla Machado is transferring to Capital Brazilian Adventist Temple in Highland, Maryland. And so do I have a motion to accept uh, Carla's transfer out? I see several hands. I'll take that as a first and second. All in favor, please say aye. And if you know Carla, please wish her well. We are glad... We are glad that she has a church, but we will miss her here. And uh, I was looking back at a Machado back there. But we're glad to, uh, that she's uh, settling there at Capital uh, Brazilian Church. And we also have an incoming membership transfer, and that's Rachel Nichich. And I would like to ask Rachel to stand. Rachel is transferring to us from Naples, Florida. And there's some information there in the bulletin. But she's originally from New Jersey, so just one of our neighboring states, uh, not too far away, where she attended a Garden State Academy there in Tranquil, New Jersey. Wow, what a great name, right? Tranquil, New Jersey there in Garden State Academy. Uh, she loves all things tropical, which is why she moved from Florida to Maryland. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, Rachel. No, but she, she moved here because uh, her daughter lives here and, grand, and granddaughter as well. Uh, she's currently working for the military where she is being trained to uh, fake illnesses so the medical students can make assessments and diagnosis. You're being trained to fake illnesses. That's what feign illness is. That's wonderful. Uh, so you'll have an acting career after this as well. So to fake, and she has three adult children. And like I said, I know one of her daughters lives here and sometimes here with us. But Rachel has been here for a while and she's gotten involved already in serving. And so thank you so much, Rachel. We're glad to have you as a part of our church family already. But let's make this official and vote her in today. Can I have a motion to accept Rachel into membership? I see several hands. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Let us welcome Rachel into our church family. Thank you, Rachel. And I also want to say hello quickly to uh, Clayton and Carol Hayward, who are part of our church family through the digital means, and they are in upstate New York, uh, Syracuse. And so we're glad to have them here with us. Bill, didn't you use the pastor somewhere up there in Syracuse somewhere? So uh, upstate New York, Clayton and Carol Hayward. And so welcome, and we're so glad that you are uh, joining us every Sabbath, and we just pray that we'll continue to be a blessing to you as well. We're so glad to have all of you here with us today, and we just pray that the Lord will minister to all of us as we continue in our worship. At this time, I want to invite you to just uh, take a moment to prayerfully, between you and the Lord, prepare your hearts and your minds uh, to communicate with God as we listen to this prelude.
Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come into this place of worship and to worship you, Lord. We thank you that you not only enter into this space, but Lord, that you tell us that you will enter into each and every heart that invites you in. So Lord, we invite you into our hearts that you will communicate to us. As you've already done through the music, continue to communicate to us through the singing of this blessed group. We pray that you'll speak to us through the baby dedication and through the prayers, through your spoken word. Lord, help us to leave this place knowing you and loving you more. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated.
It's that time I'm going to invite little Israel and little Gabriel to bring their parents up here, uh, to bring Jermaine and Jean up here, to have them dedicated to the Lord. So, three things, one for the parents and then one each for the beautiful boys. Um, in, in Proverbs 22, verse 6, there's this very popular proverb that you're familiar with, I'm sure. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is older, he will what? Not depart from it. Now, one of the things that parents sometimes have a trouble with is that Proverbs, we think, sometimes are promises, that if we follow them, we're guaranteed for our children to be in the kingdom. But many of us know who have older children that we can raise four kids the same way, and not all of them will end up following Jesus. So Proverbs are not uh, promises, they're Proverbs. And Hebrew scholars say about Proverbs 22, verse 6, it's more of a warning. Train up a child in his own way, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. As you, Jean, and Jermaine are dedicating your children to Jesus, that's just a reminder for you and for us as parents that what we allow them to do and be at this age will determine their life. And if you let them have their way, because I know they have strong wills and they'll have their way, that will be their way. But if you, if you train them to follow God's way when they're young, they will continue to do that as they're older. And we are just so grateful that you are deciding to do that. We know you bring them to church. We know that you are discipling your children. And this is just a reminder of something that you're already doing. <clears throat> now, little uh, Israel, which one? Little Israel. Oh, wave to everyone, little Israel. <laughs> little, little Israel, your name is very important. Your mom and dad picked your name specifically in a very special way because your name comes from a man who wrestled with God. And you know what? You won. You actually beat him. <laughs> and so, uh, Israel, as you wrestle with life and you go through life, you, I want a blessing to be on you, little man, that <laughs> he doesn't care. He doesn't want <laughs> that you, little Israel, will contend with God and you will win. And you will have a life of victory and triumph. And little Gabriel, hi, little Gabriel. <laughs> I'm going to come over here. <laughs> little Gabriel, <laughs> your name means God is our strength. And every time Gabriel, the angel of God, shows up in Scripture, everyone is scared of him because he's powerful and he's mighty. And Gabriel, you're going to grow up to be a powerful and mighty man. But I pray that your strength would be used to bring people closer to Jesus and not repulse them further away. You're going to have a mighty influence for God, you and Israel. And together, if you work together, anything is possible with what God can do in your life. What a privilege to have these beautiful boys. Well, let's pray together, and hopefully they won't run away on us. <laughs> Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the blessings of little Israel and little Gabriel. They're little right now, but soon, in the blink of an eye, they'll be strong men of God. And so in the meantime, as you've given them to their beautiful parents, Jermaine and Jean, I pray a special prayer of dedication on them, on this entire family, that they would be trained in the ways of the Lord so that they would be mighty soldiers in his army for the rest of their lives. I pray for their parents as they continue to go through the sleepless nights and the, the battles that continue for the rest of their days. I pray that you give them strength, that you give them courage, that you give them patience, that you give them the love that will lead their children in the way that will best help them find you. And I pray for little Gabriel and little Israel as they continue to grow, that you would keep them safe, that you would send your Holy Spirit to their hearts and their minds right now to draw them to you. And that, Lord, from this moment on, not only them as a family, but we as a church would be as supportive as possible to make sure that this family makes it to the kingdom. 
And so, dear Father, we are so thankful for this family. We ask a special blessing of your Holy Spirit on them. And we thank you, Lord, for what you promised in Scripture, that whatever we ask in prayer, Lord, you hear and you answer. So this is what we pray. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, amen. I just want to, on behalf of the church and the school, we have a present for you, and we just want to give that to you. And uh, we're so happy that you guys are a part of the church family, and we look forward to seeing them grow. And our kids can be buddies. They're going to get along. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All righty, boys and girls, it's time for the children's lesson or story. So come on up and don't miss any of those dollar bills or fives or tens or twenties or whatever they hand you. It is a huge blessing for the school because those dollars, of course, help our kids be able to attend Christian education. Come on up. Here they come. Yeah, and by the way, my bucket is not for the money. My bucket's not for the money. <laughs> oh, it's nice to see some bigger kids up here too today. That's great. So now I have several questions for you. Number one, anybody know what God's first book is? Before the Bible. Any, any, any guesses? What do you think God's first book is? It still is. Oh, down here. Oh, okay. What? You can just say it out. What is it? Huh? Genesis. Genesis. That's the first book of the Bible. That's great. But not the Bible. Before the Bible was written, remember, way back. Anybody like going outside, outdoors? Outdoors. How about it being outdoors in God's creation? Have you been? Nature. Good job. I think you had help on that. Good job. Very nice. Yes, you know, Mr. B loves, I, I am Mr. Braga, but I go by Mr. B at school, so I've been called that a long time. Too many years to even talk about. But anyhow, um, I love outdoors. I love to go anything from snow skiing to backpacking to bicycling to hiking, all kinds of fun things like that. When I was really, way back when I was young, I was about, oh, 40 years old, uh, we, I was working at this camp called Cahutta Springs in northern Georgia, down by Southern Adventist University. And it was pretty fun because I got to be outdoors a lot. We did all kinds of crazy things like whitewater rafting and ropes and rock climbing. And we even did an activity that was what I kind of grew up with is going into caves. Anybody? been in a cave? Any of you been in a cave before where you walk in and you go in and you have to have a flashlight or something? Well, that's pretty exciting, but can be a little bit scary for some people because do you like being, how many like um, being in a cave where it gets in a tight spot and you can't move? It's called claustrophobic, a big, no, big word. I get, I get kind of nervous even thinking about it. Well, anyhow, one of my privileges, our jobs at this camp, was I had to take teenagers into a cave 
because their youth leaders wanted us to wear them out. And so we would do this whole week long thing where they go backpacking, canoeing, and they would end up going into this cave. This cave was called Howard's Waterfall Cave. Now, it was pretty flat, but it, the really unique thing is it had to do with spending the night in a cave. Anybody spend the night in a cave? I have to admit, growing up, I had never spent a night in a cave. And so at first, I was like, whoa, that's, that's a little different. I was like, how do you spend a night in a cave? And so, well, there's a lot of things you have to take. Of course, if you go backpacking when you're not underground, I mean, you have a backpack and sleeping bag. But when you go into a cave, you have to have, you know, some different things. So like, here, I'll show you. I have my helmet. What do you think the helmet would be for? So you don't hit your head on the Oh, you are very smart. Yes, that is correct. I have my helmet. Let me put my helmet. Well, let's put it on. Let's put it on here. This would be this. So the helmet, yeah, protects your head. So I'll throw the helmet on. In a cave, of course, there's a lot of, they call them stalactites. And, of course, just the, the cave itself can be kind of scary if you're not seeing where you're going. I bet you would like to go in a cave, huh? You look like you're ready. Well, and then, of course, you have to have a light, right? So the, the light's up there. But what in the world would a bucket be for? And also in here, now, I didn't put everything in here. Anybody know what this is? Tape. Duct tape, right. Duct tape's good for a lot of things. Well, the bucket and the duct tape come in really handy if you're spending the night in a cave. And so we'll, we'll talk about that later, but anyhow, that can come in real handy. Now, I was pretty much, when I was young, 40 years old, hello, that's not super young, right? I thought I knew what I was doing, but I had to explore this cave before I actually took people in. And the lesson today is, where in this cave, there was a place that was called the birth canal. Now, in other words, it was a very, very small space. And as my friends, my college students that helped work with us, they said, oh yeah, this is not a problem. You, you just walk down in this cave and then you come to this little hole, you crawl down in this hole and then you scoot on your belly for about 200 yards with about a foot and a half of space. It'd be like, it'd be like this. I'd be on down, I'd be down like this, and you only had a little bit, and you had to crawl for 200 yards. It's a long ways. And before I even got there, have you ever been nervous or ang have anxiety like I'm getting right now, even just talking about it? It made me really nervous. Like, I'm not doing that, no way. Because the one guy told me too, oh yeah, we had one person get stuck and we had to pull him out. I'm like, oh great, you think I'm going to take someone in here? And then the key to the story was my friend, Clark. He, he, was, the, he was the director, I was the associate director at Cahutta Springs for the Outdoor Ministries and he said, you know, what you do, Paul, that's my first name, he says, when you go down on your belly and you get down in there, you're going to be nervous. But all you have to do, well, I said, yeah, pray, pray for sure. But just relax. Go down because it's kind of like this floor. So I got down when I actually got in there after and I got down there. He said, just relax. It's cool. You can make it through if you just relax. And it was pretty cool because it worked. And I got through that, and it was so it was so crazy, though, because God, he really did help me. And what was really cool is that as we finished that whole training time, when it came time to take others through, now, of course, we did not make people go through the birth canal, but spending a night in a cave was something I had never done either. And when it's in a cave, it's so dark, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. You just can't even see that, it's really, but it, what, what was really cool about being at a cave where it's so quiet, you hear nothing either. 
And just like with Jesus, guys, when you spend time with him, you have to shut off, and I have to shut off all the distractions. One of my favorite texts in the Bible is be still and know. Be still and know. And I encourage you, and today as you listen to Pastor Chad, there will be different ways of kindness shown to you. But I guarantee you guys, as we pray here in just a moment, you guys are getting ready for the cave, huh? Can we, let's, let's just say, uh, let's just ask Jesus to, to come into our hearts here real quick before we go back. And we're going to be still, though, for just a few seconds. Everybody, can we just be really quiet? And let's see if we can hear Jesus talking to us. You ready? Okay. Dear God, thank you. Even in a, a tight spot in a cave or a challenge we have, right now we want to just spend a few seconds listening to your voice. Oh, Jesus, you know what? I praise you for these kids because these kids show us adults how to be happy, how to live a joyful life. Jesus, today, help us to be kind. Help us to have joy. Just And the music today already has blessed me just what it's going to be like when we get to be at your, in your throne. We, we can't wait, Jesus. Give us a great rest of our Sabbath in your holy name. Amen. Okay, have a great Sabbath. You may go back to your seats, guys.
congregation, please kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, we come today to worship you. We think of you on your throne in heaven, the glory that surrounds you, and it makes us feel humble and insignificant. And yet you send your son to this earth to show us your love and your mercy. And your son died on the cross that we can all be worthy of eternal life with you once again. We have been reconciled to you and we thank you for that. Lord, there are many things on our hearts that we would like to, to ask you. Most of all, we ask that you help us to follow in Jesus' footsteps, that we spend more time with you every day, learning about you, listening to you, being guided by you. We ask you to be with those in the congregation who are absent today for whatever reason, but especially to be with those who are sick. Lay your healing hand upon them and restore them to health if it is thy will. We ask you to give them courage, give them patience, give them the joy of looking to the future when we can all be with you in heaven. And there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more crying, no more death. We ask you to forgive us, Lord, when we have offended you, when we have lost a moment, when we could have spoken for you to others, but we're not sensitive to your talking to us. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us in all that we do and all that we say. May we reach out to others and be a blessing we thank you for the connect groups we have in this church and help others to join. It is so special to belong and to feel that you belong, to be able to share and to lift each other up. We ask you to bless our pastors. They all have so many responsibilities and at times are taken away from their responsibilities to other responsibilities and distractions. We ask you to bless them, bless their families, we thank you for nature and the beauty that uh, either we can enjoy now or that we have enjoyed in other seasons. Help us, Lord, to appreciate all the things that you have made. And now as we think about your glory, your mercy, we ask you, Lord, to take us home to heaven and we pray that it will be soon, very soon. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.
Thank you, choir, for that blessing. Appreciate it so much. Thank you, Anwar, again, for being here. We've been richly blessed. And Jidong on the piano, I don't know where you went, but wonderful job. We're blessed by that. And uh, uh, if you want to hear more from this beautiful instrument, another great pianist is going to be here at 4 p.m., Alexander Corbin. So uh, feel free to uh, join us then for that. I also want to remind you of something I told you all last week. But just want to let you know again that after this worship service, after the postlude, uh, there will be pastors and elders and others up here to pray with you. If you have some burden on your heart that you want to have someone pray with you about, feel free to just come up after the service and we would love to pray with you. Let's pray now. Jesus, thanks so much for this morning. Thank you for already the blessings that we received, um, the reminders of your great love and salvation. Salvation has been given to all of us simply if we receive it, Lord. We thank you for loving us as we are and coming and drawing near to us. Bless us in these next few minutes, I pray. As I speak, Lord, speak through me, I pray. Amen. I have never, ever started a sermon. I've never even mentioned or thought I would ever mention uh, Mary Shelley's classic character, uh, Frankenstein in a sermon. Maybe you didn't think you'd ever come to this church and hear about Frankenstein in a sermon, but today is your day. There's always time for new things. In the 1935 uh, sequel to the original Frankenstein movie, the movie is known as The Bride of Frankenstein, there is this scene in that movie that I was, I was writing this sermon uh, came into my mind and I was thinking about this scene. To set it up for you, Frankenstein is in some woods. He's been shot by a hunter, and he's in these woods. He's, he's uh, injured, he's, he's angry, he's fearful, and he's, he's hiding out in these woods away from uh, these hunters. And he hears this violin playing. And he's, he's there, he's growling, he's kind of rumbling as best he can. And, and he hears this violin gently playing, and he he listens and he turns to see where it's coming from and he sees a light off in the distance at this cabin. And he begins to wait, make his way towards the cabin. And he stands outside the cabin listening for a while to this man who is inside playing this violin, softly playing this violin. Frankenstein then walks to the door and all of a sudden he pounds on the door and breaks it open and he comes in and he lets out a, a growl as best as he can. I have to say that they didn't even growl with as much animation in 1935 as, as it would be now. But in this 1935, to the best of their ability, this man came in trying to be intimidating, Frankenstein, and he growls at the man. But, but what the watcher would expect to happen does not happen. The man inside is not intimidated by Frankenstein. On the contrary, the man is warm towards him. He tells Frankenstein, I am blind and I cannot see you. And then he reaches out to touch Frankenstein and Frankenstein recoils and again growls at the man, but the man does not remove his hand. Rather, he keeps his hand on him and, and he slowly works his hand down Frankenstein's arm till he feels the blood on the back of his hand. And he says, oh my friend, you are hurt. Let me come, let me help you. And he pulls Frankenstein into the cabin. The man realizes in, in time, it seems like he should realize it a little quicker than he did, but he realizes in time that Frankenstein doesn't communicate very well. And he says to Frankenstein, perhaps you are afflicted too as I am. He says, I have prayed many times for God to send me a friend. It's very lonely here, and it has been a long time since any human being came into this house. I shall look after you, and you shall bring comfort to me. With that, the blind old man gets Frankenstein some food and begins to talk to Frankenstein. He then tells Frankenstein that he sh should rest, and he walks him over to a bed, and Frankenstein lays down. And when Frankenstein lays down, the, the old man kneels next to Frankenstein, takes his hands in his hands, and begins to pray. He says, Our Father, I thank you 
that in thy great mercy thou hast taken pity on my great loneliness. And now the silence of the night thou hast brought two of thy lonely children together and sent me a friend to be a light to mine eyes and a comfort in a time of trouble. Amen. And with his amen, the, man head, the man's head falls on Frankenstein's chest and he begins to cry tears of joy. The camera pans up to, to Frankenstein's face and, and he with his mouth is trying to, to mimic the word amen. And Frankenstein too has tears rolling down his cheek. And then he raises his big hand and gently lays it on his new friend's back as he falls asleep. As I thought about this scene, I wondered, if the man weren't blind, would he have touched the disfigured individual? If the man weren't blind, would he, had, would he have welcomed him into his home and into his care? If the man weren't blind, would he, had, would he have been as gentle to Frankenstein? If the man weren't blind, would he weep tears of gratitude as he knelt by this monster, this perceived monster, and prayed for him? If the man weren't blind, would he be Frankenstein's friend? Maybe not all of you, but probably most of us in here have chosen at one point or another not to welcome someone into our lives or to push someone out of our lives based on what we know or what we think we know about them. Based on something they said or did or that we think that they said or did. Maybe it's not even that the person is bad, but because we can see them with our own two eyes, and we can see who they are and how they look or maybe how they act. We just say this person is too different than us, and so we don't engage them. We don't reach out and touch them. We don't give thanks to God for them with tears of joy. Our lack of blindness, our ability to see who the person is, I wonder if sometimes that makes us more unkind more unfriendly, more unwelcoming, more unaccepting, more unloving. But such an attitude is contrary to who God calls us to be. Not only is it contrary to who God calls us to be, but I, but I want you to see how contrary it is to who God is. If you have a Bible, you can open it with me to the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus tells a story of a wandering sheep. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. A similar parable to this shows up in the book of Luke chapter 15 and that is the one that we as preachers most often reference where, where Jesus is rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees. But, but Matthew's version caught my eye as I was writing the sermon because of the verse that just precedes this story. Verse 10. It is the introduction to this parable in Matthew's version of the lost sheep. And it reads like this in verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Now there's debate, scholars debate, is he talking about the children that were just referenced before? Is he talking about all of God's children? I would say I don't think it's either or, it's both and. He's talking about children. He's talking about all of God's people, all of God's children. And he's saying, see that you do not despise any of my people. See that you do not despise any people. Now the word despise, some of your translations will say, do not show contempt for, do not look down upon. I read one version that says, do not fail to welcome. 
But Jesus tells us why we shouldn't look down on them. And this is very key. I want you to hear this. He says, do not look down on them, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now, this is referencing, I think, guardian angels and, and them having access to God. But, 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 but the larger point that Jesus is trying to make here is that, is that those who are watching over these wandering sheep, these wandering children, these folk that we maybe push away because we can see them and we can see who they are, these people, God has a special insight for. He sees them. The, their angels come to the Father in heaven to report on what is going on in their lives. He's saying that God has a special understanding of what has led these individuals to wander away from him. When I read this verse, I realized, I was like saying, I realized that God was saying to us, these people that are wandering, I know everything about them, and yet I still pursue them. We can see, and so we push people away. God sees, and he draws near. He draws near. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 states it like this. Everything, listen to this, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give an account to. Everything in my life, everything in your life, is laid bare before God. Now, to some of you, that might not be so unnerving. To some of us, that would be pretty unnerving. I, I know that I tell a lot of stories, and some of you probably have at times said, man, I can't believe he's saying that in front of all of us. I know that I've gone home, and I've had my wife say, I can't believe you said that in front of all of us. But I... I, I I just have to tell you, there's skeletons that you'll never see that are in my closet. And yet God sees all of those things. God has perfect vision of all of those things. And the God of the universe sees all of that. And this story in Matthew says that, that my angel goes and reports to God. And, and God understands everything that is going on in my heart. And everything that is going on in my life. And God understands everything that is going on in your heart. And everything that is going on in your life. And God says... And therefore, I draw nearer to them. I draw nearer to them. We think we know people. So we're unwelcoming to them. We think we see and understand why people are the way we are. And so we, we push them away. We see with our clear vision, or at least we think our clear vision, the difference between us and them. And so we don't reach out with a kind word or a helping hand. That's not my problem. We all have our Frankensteins that we cower away from. We all have our Frankensteins that we back away from. And yet we, in the light of the almighty, all-powerful, all-wonderful, all-generous and gracious God, we are Frankensteins and God seeing that clearly, not the blind man who can't see who he's opening the door for, but a God who sees clearly comes to us and touches us and lays his hand on us. And when we pull back, God moves closer. And when we growl, God comes in and pulls us towards him. That is the God we serve. A God who wants to be friends with you, his Frankenstein, and with me, his Frankenstein. It's amazing if you think about it. It's amazing. And when we really understand that we are Frankensteins, that Jesus moves towards disfigured, unclean, unholy. And Jesus says, I pursue, I pursue, I pursue. When we really understand that we are Frankensteins, that Jesus moves towards, that, that Jesus opens the door for, that Jesus lays his hands upon, that Jesus kneels by us and rejoices over us. I love Zephaniah 3.17, and the Lord rejoices over us with singing. Me? You? He rejoices over us with singing. When we start to understand that truly, in those moments when we have clarity on that, something happens. 
we begin to move towards the Frankensteins in our lives. We begin to move towards others that we had not planned on engaging. You see, I believe that when we understand truly just how amazing it is that, that God wants to be near us, it changes our perception on the people that we're interacting with, and we have a desire to draw near to others we never thought we would. Recently, I was getting a pedicure. I'm a runner, you gotta take care of your feet, right? And even if I wasn't a runner, a pedicure is nice. I went to church today, what did the pastor talk about? Frankenstein and him getting pedicures, it was awkward. It was awkward. So recently I was getting a pedicure, true story. I was getting a pedicure and I went to a place I hadn't been before and uh, I was sat down and I, and I was uh, opening my Bible, I was reading my Bible, I was reading John chapter 15. John chapter 15. In the beginning of John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me and I'll remain in you and all this connective, uh, uh, talking about being connected to God and I'm reading through John chapter 15. And I come to John chapter 15 and verse 15. And John chapter 15 and verse 15 says this, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friend. Instead, I have called you friend. And I paused there. And I began to ponder this idea. That the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, knowing everything he does about me, calls me his friend. And I was just sitting there thinking about this as, as this lady was cutting my toenails and pushing back my cuticles and scrubbing my calluses. And I was, I was, I was just pondering this over and over again and thanking God that, 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 that he sees me not as his servant, but that he sees me as a friend. And suddenly... There was this desire in my heart to connect with this lady holding my feet in her hands. When, when I walked in, she, she gave me the plastic thing, ladies and maybe a few men, you know this thing that they give you and it tells you what pedicure you want. I'm cheap, so I did the classic one, the cheapest one. And I said, classic, and she said, okay. And then she asked me, was the water too hot or too cold? I said, it's just fine. Do you want the massage chair on? I said, yes, please. And 15 minutes had gone by and not one word had been spoken between us since that. And then I read this. The God of the universe considers me a friend. And suddenly, this person had immense value in my life. Because I believe that, that when we understand truly that God wants to be a friend of this Frankenstein, that, that people take on a new dimension and have a new value in our eyes, in our lives. And I had this immense desire to co connect suddenly with her, and so, so I closed up what I was reading, and I, and, and, I, and I looked at her, and I said, where are you from? And she said, Vietnam. I thought, what do I know about Vietnam? What do I follow that up with? I know about a war. Maybe that's not the best thing to talk about. So I said, how long have you been doing this? And she said, 10 years, but two years here. And then suddenly I thought to myself, I don't know anything about pedicuring either. I, I washed someone's feet at church a few weeks ago. I mean, I could talk about communion maybe, but, but no, that didn't seem to work. And she's then was kind and reciprocated and said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I'm a pastor of a local church and stone silence. <laughs> she obviously knew as much about pastoring as I knew about pedicuring and we're just sitting there, but I was still thinking, how can I connect in some way? How can I, how can I bless this woman's day in some way? And then she asked me, do you have kids? And I said, yes, I have three sons. I have a 14 year old, a 12 year old and a 10 year old. And when I said this, I saw she had a mask on, but I could see her eyes light up and I said, do you have kids? And she said, yes, I have a 10-year-old son. 
And I said, oh, that's great. And we began to talk about the 10-year-old son. And she said, what grade is he in? And I said, or she said, my son's in fourth grade. Is your son in fourth grade? I said, yes. This made her really excited that our 10-year-olds were both in fourth grade. And we began to talk about this. And, and suddenly there was this connection there. I think it made my foot rub go longer too, which was not a bad thing. <laughs> but this person who has been, had been in a way my servant suddenly became someone that I had a desire to connect with because it dawned on me, I'm sitting here not communicating with a fellow person that God wants to call a friend. A friend. When I got up, she shook my hand and said, I'm Jesse, and I said, I'm Chad, and do you know where I will go next time? To see Jesse. Because this is a child of God. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's, he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's our creator. He's our savior. He's our intercessor. He is almighty and all powerful. There is nothing that he cannot do. Standing in the presence of Jesus we are filthy rags, and yet Jesus, with eyes wide open, not like a blind man not knowing who he's reaching out to, not like a blind man not knowing who he's welcoming in, with eyes wide open, he sees us and says, I want to be Frankenstein's friend. That is what I want you to take home with you today. That you are someone that God considers worthy to call a friend. That you are someone that God has all of your life laid bare. Maybe even things that your own spouse doesn't know. Your best friends don't know. Just in the corners and deepest recesses of your heart. And God our Savior, Jesus Christ, draws near, puts his hands on you and says, come in. Let me take care of you. Let me help you. I want you to leave here with that. And if you leave here understanding that and knowing that truly in your heart, then I believe that you will be a mighty influence for God. Because when you know that though you are a Frankenstein, Jesus wants to be your friend. You will look around you and you will see people with different eyes and you will want to connect with them so that they too can know that though their life is laid bare before the God of the universe, he wants to be their friend too. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords the God of love and grace and mercy and almighty power he kneels beside us, beside us and he thanks God for us. Though sometimes we look in our own mirrors and we don't see anything for God to be thankful of. God sees us as his friends. And I thank you for that. I pray, Jesus, that every person in this room will leave with the assurance that God considers them worthy to be pursued, that God considers them worthy to be his friend. And Lord, I pray that as we have that assurance, that it will help us to be blind to the things that push us away from others and that our eyes will be opened to a, a universe, a, a human family that is in desperate need of the love and the touch and the care of Jesus as well. Help us, Lord, to this end and give us the assurance of your love, I pray. Amen.
before you go today, if there's a prayer or burden on your heart that you want to pray with someone, there'll be individuals up here to pray with you one-on-one, -on -one, and we invite you to do that following the postlude. Let us bow our heads. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy. Just as we sang in that hymn, I pray, Lord, that we will be living examples of people that understand that, that you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, wants to be our friend. Lord, I pray for each person in here. There's people with struggles and sins and challenges and even at times as deep as self-loathing, Lord, I pray that they will know that you see them and you love them unconditionally. Lord, I pray for your love to continue to change me, to change my brothers and sisters. And Lord, may we be your love to a world in need of that grace and mercy. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you.